So we formed a contract and we're sure that we've got a contract in place, that it's enforceable. So now the next step that we need to take is to understand what's in the contract, what are the terms of the contract. And so to do that, we want to be able to distinguish the terms of the contract from other statements or representations that might be made that aren't part of the contract. So let's get into that. So the terms of a contract are the specific details that describe each party's rights and obligations. Broadly speaking, there are two types of contractual terms. Express terms, which as the name implies are specified, and that's what we're going to concentrate on. But there are also implied terms that might not be written anywhere. Now they can be implied by the courts, and we actually don't cover that in BSB 111. What we do cover next week though are some statutory terms. So we might have a law, a statute, that actually puts terms into a contract. So the terms of a contract here, as we can see in this diagram, are made up of the stuff that's written down or said, the stuff that's expressed, but it's also made up of terms that come in because of statute, they're imposed by statute, or terms that the court will imply are in the contract. Okay, so it's not just what's written there, it can be more than that. But we're gonna concentrate here on these express terms, the stuff we have more control over. And our starting case is a really important one, Lestrange and Graukop. So in this, Lestrange enters into a contract with Graukop to buy a cigarette vending machine. Okay, so Lestrange is buying a, a cigarette vending machine from Graukop. Now what we have here is because it's a business deal, there is a printed document which Lestrange signs, the contract, and it turns out the machine doesn't work. So Lestrange sues for a breach of implied warranty that the goods were fit for purpose. So if we go back to here, what, we're, what there was no express term that the cigarette machine would work, but often what the courts will do is imply that there's a term that it will work. And that's often quite reasonable, right? Because if you buy a cigarette machine, you expect that it's going to work. But in this case, Graukob was relying on, an, on a disclaimer. So there was a, 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 claw, a term in the contract which excluded these implied warranties. Lestrange didn't know that the contract contained this clause. And in fact, the court noted that it was in regrettably small print, but quite legible. So obviously it was kind of hidden in the contract that you really would have had to look to read it. But if you did look, you could see that it was there. And so the court had to deal with this idea, you know, when someone kind of semi hides a term in a contract, are they still bound by it? Now, originally in the court of first instance, they found that Graukob didn't give notice of the clause. They hadn't let Lestrange know about it who, and, and she was unaware of it. And so the clause didn't apply. But that was overturned on appeal. And so this is why it's so important. On the appeal, they said that in the case of written signed documents, it doesn't matter if you've read it or not, the parties are bound by the written contract. Now this is one of the reasons, this case is one of the reasons why people say, you know, signed written documents are so important. This meant Lestrange was bound by the contract that she couldn't rely on an implied term because that was excluded by the written contract and so she had no grounds to sue. This is a classic and very important case, right, because what it sets out is if you've got a signed written document, what's in that signed written document are the terms of the contract and it's very, very, very difficult to inject other terms or to ignore those terms. In fact, it's virtually impossible, which is why they're so important and something you should leave the course remembering. So in general, express terms are those explicitly agreed by the parties. They can be in writing or they can be oral or verbal. If the parties write their contract down and it's signed, then the terms are what's in the written contract. They're binding even if one of the parties hasn't actually read it. If the terms are not followed, the contract is said to be breached. Now a contract can be written, can be verbal, or can be a combination.
And so we've just got to start working out when we've got words being said and things being written or just words being said, what's in and what's out. What's specifically about statements that are made prior to a written contract are these terms of the contract. Not everything you say is going to be a term of the contract. There are things called non-contractual representations. So they're things that are meant to induce you to, to enter the contract, but they're not a term of the contract. These uh, non-contractual representations aren't part of the contract. So even if they're breached, there's nothing you can do. So for instance, if I'm selling you my push bike and I say, oh yeah, it's the fastest push bike, and it turns out that it isn't the fastest push bike, there's nothing you can really do, right? Because that's more of a representation or it's puff. It's meant to get you to buy the bike. So we have to be able to differentiate you know, statements that we say to try and get someone to enter the deal from statements that are actually taken to be terms of the contract that you're guaranteeing this to be a true state of affairs. And to help with that, we've got the case of Dick Bentley Productions and Harold Smith Motors. This case involves Dick Bentley, funnily enough, who is looking for a Bentley car. He wants one that's in good condition, one that's been well vetted. Harold Smith Motors has come across a Bentley and they recommend it to Dick Bentley. He's told the car has had one owner, a German Baron, and that the German Baron had fitted the car with a replacement engine and gearbox, and it had only done 20,000 miles since the replacement. So on the basis of that statement, Bentley buys the car, but soon finds out that that statement wasn't true. It turns out the car has done nearly 100,000 miles since the refit. So the question here is whether the statement that the car had only done 20,000 miles, is that statement in the contract? Or is it just a representation in order to get Dick Bentley to enter the contract? Well, in this specific instance, the court held that that statement was a term of the contract. And in fact, what the court did was set out a test to help us work out whether a statement is a term of the contract or a representation. So the first thing that the court looks at is the time lapse between the statement and the contract. The closer the statement is made to when the contract's entered into, the more likely it's a term of the contract. The second thing the court looks at is the importance of the statement, okay? So how important was this statement that it has only done 20,000 miles? Well, Bentley was looking for a well-vetted Bentley car, so he wanted one that was in good condition. So the statement that it had only done a certain mileage when it in fact had done, you know, much, much, many, many more miles was actually a very important statement. The third thing the courts look at is whether either of the parties had special knowledge, okay? And in this case, we find, yes, Harold Smith Motors did have special knowledge because they'd bought the car, they'd inspected the car, they'd seen the car, they were mechanics. They would know more about whether a car's mileage was 20,000 or 100,000. So what the court found in this case was that the statement was a term. Why? Because the statement was made close to the point of contract it was considered very important to the contract and the party who had made the misstatement should have known or had special knowledge about that particular fact, okay? So statements made even before the contract can become a term if it meets these three conditions. And there we have them set out here. Time lapse, the importance of the statement and whether one of the parties has special skill or knowledge. Now, you know how I said before, contracts can be verbal, written, or a combination. Mm, well, that, that, that's true legally. But realistically, if you have a written contract, particularly a signed written contract, it's very hard to get verbal statements made, particularly before that contract, 
into the contract as a term. They will most often be representations or something called, may sometimes be a collateral contract, okay? And we'll come back to that term. Why? Well, why is because of this next bit, the parole evidence rule. Let's have a look. So the parole evidence rule, and here, parole really means oral. That's a bit of Latin again for the word, not oval, oral, okay? If a contract's in writing, this is the parole evidence rule, if a contract is in writing, it's difficult to establish a verbal statement was intended to be a term. Why? Because the courts say, hey, if it was so important you wanted it to be a term of the contract, you should have written it down. Everything else is written down. Why didn't you write this? You've got to have a really good reason. Okay. So where a contract is in writing and looks to be complete, it's presumed that the writing contains all of the terms and oral evidence won't be admitted to add or vary it. This is the parole evidence rule. So if we've got an inconsistency between what's written in, a, in what looks like a complete contract and a verbal representation, the court favours the written term. Now, there are some exceptions because the document has to look like a complete record of the agreement. We won't go into those exceptions. We just need to know that it's very, very hard to show an exception to the parole evidence rule. And in fact, the parole evidence rule will definitely apply if you have a whole of agreement clause. So if you have a term in the contract or a clause in the contract that says this written document is the whole of the agreement, then there is no way you can get uh, other conflicting verbal statements into the contract. Now, just because the term isn't in the contract doesn't mean you can't do anything. There are other options breach of collateral contract, misrepresentation, even contravention of the consumer law, which we'll come to. But what it does mean is that your options around this particular contract are limited. There's nothing you can do about this contract. But what you might be able to do is to establish a collateral contract. So what you've got is your main contract, and then what the courts sometimes do is say if there was a really important statement made before the contract and this main contract attracts the parole evidence rule. So we can't get this statement into the main contract. Well then what the courts sometimes do is say, hang on, there's another contract, right? There's a second contract, a collateral contract, a secondary contract. And there was, if we know for a contract, we need agreement intent consideration. So what's the consideration here in this contract? Because we know that there's consideration in this contract, but what's the consideration in here contract? Well, the consideration is whatever the statement is, whatever the promise one party makes. And in return for that payment, the other party enters the main contract, right? That's their consideration. So now we have consideration. If that statement, if that representation turns out to be untrue, you can sue for breaching the collateral contract. Now, the difference, okay, Gavin, why is this so important? Why are you making a big deal? Because whether the statement's in this contract or not in this contract, they can still sue, so what does it matter? If it's a breach of collateral contract, you can only get damages, right? You can't get out of the main contract. You can only get damages. Whereas if you could get the term in and it was a major term, you could get out of this contract. So the difference is the effect. Okay, there's a big difference in what actually happens. The final thing we need to cover here is misrepresentation. So misrepresentation occurs when during negotiations, when we're talking about stuff, one party makes a false statement of fact. And that induces the other party to enter into the contract. So it doesn't include promises, statements of opinion, uh, something called puffery, which are statements of an exaggerated nature. It doesn't include silence. It must be a statement of fact. And there are three types of misrepresentation. Fraudulent misrepresentation, that's where you know you're lying. Right, or recklessly, you should know. You know or you should know you're making a false statement. Now, if we have fraudulent misrepresentation, you can get out of the contract and get damages. 
There's negligent misstatement. Now we're gonna wait till week 12 and handle negligent misstatement. That's where the statement maker has a duty of care and they carelessly, so it's negligent. They don't intentionally make it, but they carelessly make it. Again, you can get out of the contract and get damages. If it's an innocent misrepresentation, so if the statement maker genuinely believed the statement, then again, you can get out of the contract, but you can't get damages because they were innocent. Okay, so it's really important. So in misrepresentation, which we're not going to uh, examine or spend a lot of time on, but with misrepresentation, you can get out of a contract. Um, whether you can get damages depends upon the kind of misrepresentation. Whew, that's a lot. You know, we talked about express terms. We've particularly tried to distinguish between um, a term, a, a statement made before a contract and whether that gets into the contract. And then we even looked at collateral contracts to say, hey, even if we can't get it in because of the parole evidence rule, are there any other options? And we saw, yes, we've got the option of a collateral contract. We've also got this other thing of misrepresentation, which we're gonna to touch a little bit upon in week 12. Um, okay, so that gives us an idea about what's actually in the contract. One of those special things that can be in the contract is a disclaimer. We're gonna do that next. <laughs>